Good afternoon, everyone. We are here now uh, with a round table of the project called Unpopy, that's unpacking populism, comparing the formation of emotion narratives and their effects on political behavior, uh, which the PI is here with, with us, Cristiano Gianola. I'd like also to thank the organizers, uh, Carla Panico, Gaia, Marilena, that did a very good uh, job of putting everyone together here. And uh, I will start just uh, briefly with a small presentation of a few minutes uh, why they chose me to be the uh, uh, chair of the, the round table and also the difficult position to control the time of everyone. But anyway, we will we'll do a good time management, I hope so. So, uh, uh, here it's, uh, I will just do, uh, present uh, briefly what I'm doing right now in Germany. I'm linking to, uh, to KAIS, that is an institute in Bochum, in a small city uh, nearby Dusseldorf and uh, Dortmund, Münster. And the name of the institute is KAIS, that's the Center for Archives and Internet Studies. And there my, my big project is, uh, the name is The Rise of Global South WhatsAppers. And then my academic background, I have a Bachelor in Sociology from the University of Brasilia, also a Licenciatura degree in Social Science that we call Licenciatura in Brazil, that's different from the Licenciatura in, in Portugal. I have a Master in Political Sociology at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. This is 2016, I, uh, I started my, my PhD here in Portugal, and currently I'm a PhD candidate in the program Democracy in the 21st Century. That's linked to the Center for Social Studies and the Faculty of Economics of these universities. And I put a little hopes of what I do in my free time as we talk about time also <laughs> during the morning. So uh, I have been published about uh, WhatsApp activism in Brazil, and this is my, one of my latest publications. I talk about uh, how uh, activists in Brazil appropriate WhatsApp to foster social change at the local level. I also wrote two articles with an Italian sociologist based at the University of Amsterdam, Stefania Milan, about what would be this working notion of WhatsAppers and how this brings uh, different uh, uh, specific uh, kind of chat app based activists in the global south, Zoom in the case of Brazil. And also we publish about ethics, the unbalanced position between the, the researcher and the research subjects. And last year I also published for uh, a Swedish Institute for Local Democracy, a Swedish Institute that uh, also the activists were saying that I was publishing so much in English, but it was because of founding reasons to live and survive in the Anglo Saxon in Europe uh, system. And then I did a trilingual policy brief in Portuguese, Spanish, and also English. And then if you look, uh, there is a boom of research in the, the so called chat apps that we can name it like three WhatsApp, Telegram, and Signal. And for the last year, uh, academics are also looking for all these platforms and how these cross our social life in so many ways. And for here, I situate my research in the global south, uh, not reducing the WhatsApp to a European and Anglophone perspective. Instead of reductionism and particularism under the cover of university, my focus lies on why global south contest matters and zoom in the case of uh, Brazilian case study. You no, know, uh, if you look how WhatsApp crossed the social life of Brazilians, it's very different about what Europeans consider a safe activism on Signal, for example. And then I have problems with this because uh, WhatsApp was created in the U.S., also part of uh, uh, the former uh, Facebook and now Meta company. And then my research in some way look at the uh, different use and the relations in the global South countries, including the benefit itself for the political struggle and the central element guiding collect action at the local level. In some way, seeing beyond this notion of the global north that apparently is a chat app just to hang out with like-minded people. And then I situate a little bit in the south, how this contest uh, can be situated in the epistemology of the south and how can also media scholars look at this. And that's my next slide. Uh, the so-called global south have been investigated by diverse media scholars with the goal to interrogate digital practice enhanced by the global north while subverting the dominant narratives of identification. The core idea of this scholar group is decolonize research topics based on media studies as well as surveillance and privacy scholarship looking for alternative models and practice beyond the western needs, contest use, behaviors, patterns and theories. South is a proxy for a uh, hand or metaphor of resistance, subversion and creativity. Are those some troubles that I also discuss in the framework. 
So my research case is building in two main topics, that's digital sociology and digital activism. And I'm very happy with this summer school because I'm also learning a lot of things that's not be part of my research. But what I have uh, collected so far is that literature on digital activism and digital sociology was predominantly done by scholars located in the global north, mainly addressing the context of Western countries. However, those interested in and about global south coast still need to invest in a solid research agenda and bring these all use of these platforms for uh, local context. And a little bit of my PhD research design, but I will have no time to explore further here. And then I just mentioned uh, also uh, my connection with the SES school, school seminars that I'm uh, doing some uh, pedagogical sessions on how can we foster digital literacy with young people in Portugal and how this be, can be connected with the survives of the democracies in a long-term perspective, including the problem of sharing this information on this kind of, of chat apps. And then why? Because this is also in the core topics about the European Union that we talk about decolonized European in the morning. And, uh, and that's it. And I think for my German employee that also Germany suits very well. I mean, and this could be also my intervention here because we have a lot of young scholars. So if you want to go to all these topics that have been debated for the future and you need some help with founding for young people, I can help you. So just message me on my Portuguese uh, email or the German one, and I am available. And also, fast, you can reach me first on WhatsApp, Telegram, or C. So, many thanks, and then we we'll go to the, the next panelist. Thank you. Um, so, thank you, Sergio, for the presentation, and thank you, Cristiano, Marilena, Gaia, Joao, and Carla, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, as a contribution to this panel discussion about the role of notions in populist far-right discourses, I decided to draw on my previous research about the German debates about sexual crimes by immigrants and bring to the discussion one of the most mediatic rape murder cases which contributed to the moral panic around immigration from the country. Uh, on the background, you have On the background, um, you have a poster of the far-right party, German party, Alternative for Deutschland, with the photo of the victim and the murderer. My decision to present this poster here, I know it's very questionable, uh, but since uh, we are at a, in a scientific meeting, and one of the focus of my discussion is how this photo, how the picture of the victim and uh, the murder circulated in the public debate in Germany and how the far right constructed this victim as white, uh, as a white German, I thought that the risk would be manageable and that it was needed to show the picture and the frame of this picture in the German public debates. So, uh, let me introduce the case. In 2018, the rape murder of the 14-year-old Susanna Feldman by a 21-year-old asylum seeker from Iraqi Kurdistan gained intense media attention and intensified the existing moral panic about migrants as a sexual threat to the safety and autonomy of German women. Uh, the case comes in the aftermath of the sexual assaults reported in 2015-16 uh, uh, New Year's Eve in Cologne and some crimes like the rape murder of Maria, La uh, Maria Landburger in 2016 and the murder of Mia Valentin in 2017. Uh, there is a significant body, body of research of literature that examines how these events, how these crimes intensify the association between immigration and crime in the country, in spite of the fact that official statistics do not sustain this association, uh, and also how these crimes intensify the association between Islam and sexual crimes. So these crimes are, or the mediation, the way these crimes are mediated in the public sphere they fulfill calls for more border control, for the introduction of age tests for refugees and the collection of DNA samples from asylum seekers. They were used to contest America and to discredit the so-called welcoming culture as something naive. Uh, Susanna's case is part of this puzzle of sex panic about immigration, 
but it has particular features since contrary to the other victims, so the other victims were perceived as being white and German, uh, Susanna Bearsteins, which Susanna was German, <laughs> she was a German girl, uh, but she bears signs of otherness from the perspective of ethno-nativist conceptions of Germanness. Uh, Susanna's mother was a Jewish immigrant from Moldova who had moved to Germany in the 90s and her father was a Kurd who grew up in Turkey. When her mother reported her missing, the police did not take the case seriously uh, and pointed out that Susanna had already skipped school a few times in the past. Uh, then her mother wrote in Facebook a plea to Angela Merkel that said something like, Dear Mrs. Merkel, this letter is a cry for help. I feel abandoned by the German state, and it's important that this plea, because it's important how this plea was then instrumentalized. I feel abandoned by the German state and our friend and helper, the police. Not to know where a child is and whether she's okay is the worst feeling a mother can have. Three days later, the body was found. The investigation quickly identified the suspect as Ali Bashar, an asylum seeker from Iraqi Kurdistan, so like her father, and it became evident that the state police had committed several blunders. Ali's application had been rejected before the crime, and he had already been involved, and it was known that he had been involved in other crimes, so he had robbed a man at gunpoint, and then it was also found out that he had raped an 11 years old girl in the shelter. Still, he managed to escape with his family via Istanbul to his, to his hometown in Iraq. All these elements are crucial to examine how the German far right, and not only the far right, constructed Susanna as a martyr of Nato's policies. Shortly after the circumstances of Susanna's death were made public, the far-right member of parliament, Thomas Seitz, used the time he had to address his fellow members on the issue of the rules of procedures to call for a minute of silence in, remem in remembrance of Susanna Feldman. So if I, if I don't use all my time for the presentation, I will show you at the end this moment in the Bundestag. So uh, a murmur cursed through the hall, and Claudia Holt, the acting speaker of the Bundestag, pointed at the breach of protocol and asked him to vacate the podium immediately. Uh, Roth is a prominent senior politician from the Green Party and who has been, who had been long a uh, target of hate speech and threats for her commitments to multiculturalism, LGBTQI rights, and engagement with the German guild and the Holocaust. After the incident at the Bundestag, attacks on Roth intensified and she was accused of indifference towards Susanna's death and of representing or exemplifying uh, the German elite's indifference towards concerns about crimes and failures of the state. I would like to call your attention to another piece in this puzzle, Dieter Roman, head of, the Germany, of Germany's federal police forces. In certain 2015, he had a plan to close the border with Austria to prevent refugees from entering German, German territory, which was, which was vetoed by Merkel. When Ali Bashar fled to Iraq with his family, and because there was no extradition agreement with Germany, Roman flew to Iraq and convinced Kurdish authorities to deliver the suspect and, surrounded by members of Germany most elite police unity and a built report, a build is the sensationalist uh, yellow press, he brought the suspect back to Germany. And this is a picture of that moment, that picture that circulated in media. And he was celebrated among many sectors as um, a hero who had put bureaucracy aside to bring a monster to justice. Many newspapers, politicians and citizens saw, and I'm now referring to the two moments, so the moment of the Bundestag uh, with Thomas, uh, uh, with the far right, and uh, the moment with the, the police. So many voices in Germany criticized Thomas Seitz's act and saw it as a populist, shameless instrumentalization of the death of Susanna to foster anti-immigration agendas. 
And in the case of Roma, their engagement with the case, uh, many saw a kind of vendetta against Merkel and a dangerous breach of law. Susanna's mother, and now I would like to move to Susanna's mother, who has been so far absent. So Susanna's uh, mother, though, saw it differently, and there was much media attention on, on her, on her grief. So she said that in Zeit's act in the parliament, she saw a beautiful and humane gesture. And she praised Roman, so the police, as someone who prevented the murder of her daughter from running around out there, so in Iraq, raping and killing women. Before her daughter's death, she had embraced the so-called welcoming culture. And she approved her daughter spending time with refugee teenagers. So Susanna had befriended some asylum seekers from Iraqi Kurdistan, like her father, perhaps it played a role or not. Uh, and she used to spend time with them. And that's how she came in connection with the, the man who then killed her. So in the months following the killing of her daughter, the mother's grief becomes entangled in political messages. So this is not anymore the kind of grief, I'm so, yes, my life is lost because of my daughter's death and so on. So it becomes canalized to, to certain political views. So she shared calls for NATO to step down. She showed support for Putin as the protector of the German people. And this is something, if, uh, if you are not familiar with that, we can discuss it in the debate why uh, the role of Putin in all this stories about immigrants. Uh, and she also shared posts of the Jews for the alternative for Germany. So the, the far right part in Germany has a section with Jews, which sometimes is amplified abroad, like as if German Jews were all with the far right, it's far right, it's a minority, just a minority. Uh, yes, and she shared posts of this tiny group. So she saw no problem in having her daughter's picture in far rights demonstrations. And despite being herself an immigrant and not white in German social tissue, she was apparently at ease with the process by which her daughter was constructed as an emblem of German victimhood and at the hands of immigration and Merkel. So to conclude, we can dismiss the path undertaken by her as bad judgment derived from the loss of her daughter which became the framework for political engagement, so accepting as an ally anyone who expressed sympathy for a grief. We can also dismiss the case Susanna's from numbers and say, well, there are so many girls throughout the world, Germany included, who experience the same fate, and they do not make headlines and nobody cares. But we can also examine the case as an emblematic example of the manipulation of emotions by populist forces and warn about the danger of emotions for the rule of law and democracy. However, since we cannot expel emotions from the process of decision making and the political debate, and since it is inevitable that there will always be some victims who will gain more visibility than others because they are perceived or they are constructed as an emblem for something else, we can look at this case and explore the role of emotions in the political debate beyond the traditional discrediting of emotions as being irrational and as being a menace for the collective good. So I'm really sorry that I cannot offer you a theoretical framework nor solutions for this puzzle, uh, but I'm always, but I only presented you so in. Uh, some parts of the puzzle. I did not go to the Israeli part, which is also very interesting, but I, there was no time for that. So I'm just presenting you uh, briefly the case uh, in order to invite you to address the following questions. So how can, two questions basically, how can democracies and ethically responsible, responsible media address the political power of emotions, in this case grief, while resisting populism and racism, and how can democracies and media negotiate the contributions of emotions to the political debate and to emancipatory agendas? And I don't know if we have the time for the, the video or not. There are precisely 12 minutes, okay, but so you have time for the video, it's fine. So.
Do you think it's worth watching the video or not? You know it better. Okay. Uh, so. Okay, so you can see the where I took it from. So I'm reading this kind of stuff. zur Geschäftsordnung reden und äh, ich würde auch bitten, dass Sie sich an die vorgegebene Tagesordnung und an die Geschäftsordnungsdebatte halten. try to respond or attempt to understand how to respond to questions that you just raised. I don't see properly, for some reasons, the um, proportion of the screen is not correct, but this is the title of the project, it's a cooperation between session, uh, the, the center of the um, faculty of psychology, and our website will be launched soon. This uh, as an interdisciplinary team, or is also co-organizing this um, summer school, you see the disciplines there and the area of studies that we have complementing the trajectory of this project. And the rationale of the project is, sorry, one L is missing, uh, is based on two main concepts, populism and emotions. Uh, populism understood uh, through the perspective of uh, discursive approach, we know that the, contest is, the concept is contested and uh, this is the one we are uh, using as a reference, La Claudian approach to <coughs> populism, and we um, understand that it raises through um, emotional appeals based on intergroup narration of the people, so the creation of social identities of us versus them. And how we approach emotion, we take a social psychological uh, approach and we focus on both positive and negative emotions, although um, in the literature era and also in the public debate, generally negative emotions are associated with right-wing populism. We try to understand also what positive emotions are behind them. These are the research questions of the project and these are the parties we are studying two in Portugal and two in Italy. Two of them, for one per country, are clearly uh, identified as populist by the literature, and two of them 
the right-wing parties or extreme right-wing parties, at least in the case of Italy, are not clearly uh, identified as populist. So there is a debate there. We are still collecting data through these methods, mixed methods, and we are currently uh, running a survey. Also, we are doing interviews to leaders of those parties, those who accept, not many. So let's go into the um, main concepts that we are producing with, uh, or we are trying to produce with this um, project. That is emotion narratives, or emotion narrative. And this is the definition that I, I suggest. Uh, it's a, you know, work in progress. And I hope that the debate of today, we also help to refine it. Uh, hopefully not to destroy it, <laughs> but to strengthen it. I'm just leaving you some time to read it through. If you can see it. And uh, as you can see, the intergroup relation is basic in the understanding of what emotional narratives are and the idea of idealization, identification, and differentiation that are produced through emotion narratives. We uh, talk about emotions um, from um, a perspective um, that may not be, um, say, unanimously um, uptaken by political um, psychologists, uh, therefore, I, I refer to the work of uh, Sarah Hamid in, in the team. We have uh, several uh, of us that work with her uh, writings. And the fact that emotions are something that is produced in, in the social interaction, not something that is uh, uniquely bo bodily sensation. So this is a distinction that uh, needs to be done also in terms of what kind of emotions we want to, uh, we want to approach. And... Uh, we know that uh, from that approach, we know that emotions are impressions that are produced in the social interaction um, and they are created through uh, speech acts. For instance, uh, Julia's presentation has, uh, has given a good example of that. Um, so they are between people and not within, only within people. So they are uh, both social and personal, but none of them. And they are also um, currently con consecutively recreated in, in the public debate. And we also use the approach of James Jaspers, who is a um, um, political scientist, um, I guess, and he differentiates short-term emotions from long-term emotions. This is important because when we speak about <coughs> politics, we are uh, not necessarily trying to measure what kind of emotions people are feeling at the moment uh, when they are taking part on a political event or when something happens and they, they experience the reaction from political leaders. But what we want to understand is how emotions impact on their political behavior, as you have seen from the title of the project. So we want to understand how these people eventually come to vote for these parties in the ballot box where they don't have a, a direct stimulus, emotional stimulus to do that in that moment. So it's not a short-term emotion that, that drives them there, generally speaking. It's a long-term emotion. We understand it like that. And, um, and for that, we try to focus uh, on affective commitments and, and moral emotions. Now, uh, to do that, we are trying to measure, and we refer to this um, instrument uh, developed by uh, the um, School of Geneva, where we have 20 families of emotions that are mapped. We are, this is a self-evaluation uh, instrument, uh, self-assessment instrument to um, relate about emotions. But we are using also, we are using it in our survey, but also as a way to and to refer uh, emotion families. Uh, that we want to um, study. And, uh, and then we come to the impact of the political mythology. Uh, we are in the project studying both provide and demand side for non-political scientists. That basically means political, political leaders. That's the provide side. And the people or common people, they, it's the demand side of politics. 
conflicts. And generally you understand that there is a passivity on the one side and an activity on the other side. We do not understand it like that. We, uh, and with social media especially, we understand that there is uh, all the more interaction between these two sides and this is where the discourse is created and the political agency is also produced and there is where um, the political behavior is outlined. But this is also where the identity is created and it all goes together. So the intergroup antagonism structuration is, uh, takes place there. Uh, Nestor Laclau defines, uh, describes it very well. And this is a kind of uh, you know, example of how in-group and out-group are uh, <coughs> defined in the populist discourse. So you have the people, of course, otherwise you don't have populism. Uh, and then you have, we understand just two kinds of outgroups. One is the, what you see in, in blue is the elite. Anti-elitism is a basic uh, characteristic of populism. And then uh, in the case of the far right, you also have um, what we call anti-minority, uh, although we are trying to struggle to find a better uh, expression for that. Uh, anti-ethnic minorities uh, exclusion as you can see it doesn't even make sense for us to speak about migration because the problem is not uh, if people are native of the place but the problem is if they are ordered uh, from the place uh, regard, for instance Roma people are not migrating to Portugal but they are nonetheless part of this othering as you know much better than me probably. And this is political mythology, a uh, definition that I take from the literature. I give you a little time to read it. Um, but I want to um, highlight the fact that political mythologies or political myth, there is no convergence on one definition. I understand mythology as a, a set of myths, political myths but um, provides especially signification. So it gives response to the need of the people to make sense of their life and their political life by giving them uh, meaning. Uh, actually, a contextualized meaning. That's why it's signification. I'm referring to this literature, and I want just to make a, a bridge between the work on emotions and the work on, on meat. Because in the literature on meat, you see the selection of books here, but there are more. Um, there is, uh, well, Spinoza is uh, probably <coughs> the philosopher that is the basic reference for both uh, um, stream, uh, strand of research. And, uh, and there is um, an attempt, an attempt uh, uh, at least in the, what I consider the progressive understanding of political meat. There is an attempt to go beyond the dualism between um, what for, for, for the political mythology literally is called the dualism between logos and mythos. So what Western philosophy has been doing uh, for the last 2,300 years, basically since the Greek. So I have one minute left and uh, I don't want to talk about this. I want to stimulate the debate uh, in this way, but of course, it's just one hit I give to the debate, uh, leaving this uh, question. We have, we understand that positive and not, because our focus is positive and negative emotions in the far right. What we understand is that positive emotions exist and the literature is starting to deal with them. <coughs> for instance, pride, love for the country, the national anthem, all of that, you know, in these kind of parties, you always have the anthem sung at the end of the convention, for instance, that's obvious. Uh, but this is a positive emotion that is produced in relation to negative emotion for the, for the outgroup. So it's an exclusionary uh, positive emotion. So what we, what we would like to understand is if that's the only way you have positive emotions in the far right, because there are no more people voting for them. And we kind of, they are kind of the majority now if Italy goes to elections probably we may have that kind of scenario, at least in terms of uh, representation in the parliament. And so we don't understand that we are going back to 100 years ago in Europe. We hope not. That's why we are digging into these kind of questions. 
and uh, how to counter them. That's the second question. So I state this, and thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Manuel John Cruz. I'm a researcher at Tempo. I work closely with Christian. And to, today I'm going to talk about political mythologies of populist right wing parties uh, in the South European Parliament, but uh, with a focus on the Portuguese case, uh, Chega. Um, this is a working paper. Uh, we are trying to understand the impact of political mythologies from right wing parties in the democratic process and mostly to understand the use of political mythologies and how it reinforces political antagonism and its impact on political belief. Uh, Christian talked about mythology already, but I'm going to summarize a little bit that uh, mythology means to bind together social groups as wholes or establish a social consensus. This is a very simplified notion, but it's the, more or less the framework that we are working on. Uh, from this, we have to talk a bit about political culture, that is a set of elements that are shaped by party leaders, activists and members that shape their own visions of politics and inspires their fundamental choices and connects them to others like minor voters and also provides political identities and a sense of belonging. In this sense, it's close to political mythology. Uh, political culture. Uh, it, can, it tends to exist with other political cultures for what, what is called a decent democracy by Pascal. This, in my view, is, to, is the inclusion of doubts, liberal rights, uh, which are opposition, rivalry, and competition between parties. Without this, we don't, we don't have a liberal democracy. Uh, from this political culture, uh, I try to focus on, we try to focus on right-wing culture uh, from the work of uh, Führer Cesi, Cultura di Destra. Uh, that he defines right-wing culture as ideas without words. Uh, that means basically that they are abstractions that are so overused that they lost their meaning. Uh, it's the idea that um, uh, the only thing that allows the firmness of the future is our inheritance from our parents in our blood. It's a kind of symbolic and mythological language that uh, transmits sentiments of action and strength through words like tradition, blood, soil, fatherland, race, origin, nation, community, uh, etc. This also, this type of white right culture from this framework uh, tries to build a community with a sense of belonging and consolidate a political identity. This is also very closely related to political mythology. Uh, now, going to right wing mythology. The literature, literature um, finds some kinds of myths uh, associated with the right wing. The hero myth, there's also a sense of cultural, political and economic loss and uh, also a notion of sacrifice and martyrdom. This uh, to the right. That mostly comes uh, from the United States case, which is very interesting, but it's only an example. That is mostly fueled by a uh, sense of cultural displacement and the loss of, uh, of the American exceptionalism. Uh, it also appears to uh, appeals to fears of decline and cultural homogeneity. Also a loss of political and economic power. Uh, the mythology itself, it's linked to, to the notion of the, or the view as the United States as a city upon a hill, a promised land, uh, with divine characteristics. Uh, in this sense, there's also romanticized the idea of the southern agrarian values of community, honor, property and chivalry as opposed to the North, which, which is individual, dishonest and vulgar. There's this idealization of the pre-civil war South as an idyllic and heavenly place, which I link closely to Taggart's uh, ideal populist heartland, uh, which is shared with the favorite community, the in-group, the people, if you will. Uh, there's also the American dream that shapes the, the American culture, and it's uh, pull yourself by your bootstraps mentality, popularized by the works of Horatio Elder. Uh, this type of right-wing culture, uh, based on action and strength, uh, and transmitted to words like tradition, blood, soil, and fatherland, etc., can lead to moral tribalism and increase polarization, uh, which means in practice that there's a division within the population of the community according to shared values with their own group in perceiving and categorizing other, uh, categorizing other values as being objectively right or wrong. 
Uh, this polarization, fragmentation in groups can lead to moral tribalism, which in turn may lead to illiberal democracy, which is the will of the majority to determine public policy, with this regard to individual and minority rights. This associates more with the populism on the right, and can also can lead to undemocratic liberalism, where is the supremacy of the individual, uh, which I link more, most closely to the populism on the left. Uh, anyway, we, are, um, we focus more on the, on the right-wing type of populism, which is mostly illiberal, or has illiberal tendencies. Uh, Kazmuda says that populism is the illiberal democratic response to undemocratic liberalism, uh, which is also may be attributed to the depoliticization of some controversial issues that the elites, the, the established power, refuses to to discuss or doesn't all like to talk about, like the European integration, gay rights or immigration. Uh, we have the, the perfect example of the an illiberal democracy uh, with Viktor Orban's Hungary. He even states in 2014 that he wants to build an illiberal state or a non-liberal state. There's a rejection of the individual, uh, liberals, in favor of an extreme form of democracy. You can see in this short uh, the short speech that there's calls to action and strength, like the right wing culture from chess, like uh, with, with keywords like organized, strength, and developed, and others like uh, community, nation, and state. Uh, now, going to Portuguese right wing populist uh, mythology, I'm going to give some examples. Uh, and you can pass to this around. It has uh, my handwriting. Uh, I hope you can uh, understand it. Uh, but mostly, we can, be, we can identify from the parliament speech from André Ventura that the people are, are under attack. He, he calls upon we, we pay taxes, always paying for the same, forgetting the vast majority of the Portuguese world. Uh, there's a defense of the Portuguese identity, nationality and citizenship. Uh, when he attacks the law of nationality. He criticizes that everyone who is born in Portugal is Portuguese, even if he is taking a train here. And he calls this the greatest shame and greatest attack on nationality in living memory. Uh, there's also the sense that Portugal is being run by the corrupt elite, uh, namely, namely the left, who wants to venusualize Portugal. Uh, he says that the left is major majority that wants to turn Portugal into some kind of Venezuela. There's an attack on the welfare state, which is called the welfare chauvinism or welfare populism. There's a vilification of minority groups, uh, mostly the Roma community. And there's a strict sense of us, the people who work, versus them, the ones who reach of the state. There's also a doom and gloom reality, uh, or a sense that things won't ever get better, while the left or particular socialist is in power. There's a, a part of his speech in the parliament, he says, we are living in our darkest hour. It's very funny. And also irony of a tremendous destiny. There's a deep-rooted Portuguese trauma due to corruption and austerity measures from the past. Because as you know, uh, we have been saved by external funds three times already, always because of the left. So he says that the Portuguese have this memory, and he, he points at his head, saying that the, that marks the effort of the Portuguese in this memory. Although there's hope for the future, even uh, only if Ventura and Chega uh, can reach the power. Uh, this hope is rooted on religious narratives, the uh, messianic or spastianic speech, and he adopts a underdog mentality of David versus Goliath. He also dreams of a new republic, or the Fifth Empire, as popularized by Padre Antonio And he even says, today the system still laughs at us, but the, and the system thinks it will defeat us. But sooner or later, and sooner rather than later, the system will, will be overthrown and give birth to a new republic. Uh, we have uh, I, I here some examples, just to showcase. Here he has an index finger up, which is a sign of authority to teach, he likes to do this in the parliament. We have some Judeo-Christian imagery, even if by accident it happens. Uh, he also views politics as ultra boring or very funny. Uh, in the media, in the social media, is also there's also calls to action and strength. 
This is Portuguese, but it's basically saying, uh, if you want to fight, I can fight, I'll be there, just name the hour and time. <laughs> I want to write. He also incarnates the, the voice of the people, but not the people, only uh, very specific people. It's the Portuguese, Portuguese way. The, well, the translation is not the, the good Portuguese, maybe. And this is also when he first rose to fame, to infamy, when he started politics, where he attacked the Roma community. This is when he was elected uh, deputy for the parliament. He arranged his photo op uh, with uh, Visa, where he's, he shows his religious background. And that's all. We have the, also the pictures. Which...